joining us for today's climate action webinar, Building to Campus Scale, Water Strategies in a Changing Climate. AI California has developed a climate action webinar series to address various climate action topics, including zero net carbon design, mandatory continuing education. We will provide links in the chat box where you can find our climate action webinars and free ZNCD on-demand education. To qualify for continuing education credit, AI California provides the learning objectives for every webinar and includes them in the PDF presentation that can be made available online. A few quick housekeeping reminders. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted on the AIA California website, www.aiacalifornia.org, along with any additional resources. Today's session qualifies for 1.5 AIA HSW Learning Unit and for those who stay on and watch live. AIA California staff will report these units for you. It can take several weeks before your credits are posted to your AIA transcript. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for today's presenters. You can also like a question to move it to the top of the queue. Finally, cultivate a positive learning environment. AI California sincerely acknowledges the professional expertise our volunteer presenters provide. We greatly appreciate the diversity of perspectives and recognize that items presented in today's session may elicit a variety of responses. We strongly encourage attendees to be constructive in their comments and questions to the presenters and to one another to ensure we have a session that is a productive and uh, that is a productive environment and that is a positive learning experience for everyone. I'd now like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Laura Dolsky, AIA, is a champion for sustainable design and integrating sustainable solutions on projects throughout California. She has designed and managed a variety of projects throughout her career, from the programmatic stages of design through budgeting and construction administration, with specialized expertise in multifamily housing, special needs schools, and mixed use office projects, including design of institutional, transportation, and healthcare facilities. I'll now hand it over to Laura. I would like to introduce our speaker for today's program, Aaron English. Aaron is a practice leader and a senior water resources engineer, where she leads Biohabitat's visionary integrated water strategies, planning and engineering efforts. She applies her background in chemical and environmental engineering with her passion for water, ecology, and regenerative design to help clients advance innovation in one water-oriented infrastructure planning and design. Her 17 years of experience include numerous landmark high-performance building projects that prioritize water reuse, five of which have been awarded AIA COAT Top 10 recognition. She's also been a COAT Top 10 technical reviewer for water strategies. We are lucky to have her as a return speaker. Last year, giving the presentation on net positive water and the Candata Living Building, where she discussed living within our water carrying capacity. This year, she is dis discussing adaptive management for one water that spans the scale gradient from building to neighborhood and shares best practices from the perspective of a one water paradigm, which seeks to unify often disparate water systems, such as stormwater, wastewater, and water reuse. Take it away, Erin. Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, I want to thank the hosts and have um, uh, I'm just a lot of gratitude for being here today. It's great to be back, actually, after, um, after last year. Let me just make sure I'm sharing. Let's see. There we go. Okay, great. So yeah, great, grateful to be here. Excited to answer your questions and go through um, presentation on, on adaptive management for one water strategies. I'm gonna leave some time at the end here for questions um, and, and some discussion. So um, I'm an engineer as, as mentioned here um, and with that, my focus over the last 20 years has been that bringing together of the ecological end of infrastructure and engineering and, and, and water. And so I've spent 20, 20 something years really focused on this water question. And one of my favorite groups to work with are architects and landscape architects and people in the design environment who um, have a lot of 
potential sway over how water is handled in the built environment. So I'm really excited to be here today uh, with AIA California. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview here of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm gonna zoom out at the beginning here and talk about some updates on you know, climate change conditions in the Southwest in California that might be impacting the water cycle. Give an update on water recycling policy nationwide and then also specifically in California. Going to dig into a handful of decentralized water strategies and then present two case studies, the PAE office building in Portland, Oregon, and then um, a, a retrofit project at, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico for a federal courthouse, the Dominici Federal Courthouse. Um, first though, I wanna talk through a little bit of definition and some terminology here. So my focus of this particular aspect of the water talk is on decentralized infrastructure. So projects that are smaller in scale than municipal or citywide projects, um, those that are usually uh, gonna be applied to projects that are like commercial in nature or institutional, campus, small district, um, multifamily, but I'm not gonna be addressing so much like single family residential type of scale of projects, nor like large centralized, you know, citywide water recycling facilities, though I'll touch a little bit on those. Um, these types of decentralized strategies are common in, or in historically have been common in high performance building projects that might be pursuing lead or living building, or even just have a green goal in mind, um, net zero, net positive. Um, however, part of the reason I'm excited to be here today and present some of the projects is that um, a lot of us in this world of recognizing the need to like vastly increase um, the ease of bringing these projects into fruition and, and make them more widely deployable, better understood, more affordable. And so that is part of the goal um, <clears throat> as an engineer is like to work, how, how do we actually get this more, more broadly implemented? And so today I wanna specifically talk to the ar architects, you guys about where these projects are appropriate and where they might not be, where we should be moving on from. So that's that's part of the goal. Um, you'll hear some in, interwoven uh, terminology here, like decentralized, on-site, district scale, water reuse, water recycling. They're all um, in, you know, on the same topic of decentralized systems. Okay, so first off to zoom out and talk a little bit about just an update on climate change impacts in the Southwest including California, um, is that there's a couple of big things coming that are already here. I feel like speaking in California, this is not so much like news <laughs> probably to anybody, but um, it's still important to note that a couple of changes that are expected to continue or intensify um, that impact the water cycle specifically, okay, are snowpack depths um, and the way that snow is falling um, and the timing of the runoff in the spring. Um, which also has a lot of impact on the soil moisture. This is one of the largest potential impacts around the water cycle in the Southwest here. Um, and you know, this region um, has highly urban populations, 90% of the people living in cities and a growth projection of about 70% uh, increase by mid century. So this is some incredible pressure of population growth with um, coupled with major disruptions to the way that the water cycle um, works. So um, temperatures are one element too that's changing. There is a two degrees Fahrenheit increase um, in the last century that's been measured um, and droughts themselves are predicted to become even more common, more intense, longer. Um, and so combining that with um, population growth really will I, I like even further emphasize the existing problems we already are, are seeing. Um, the folks over at the um, Southern Nevada Water Authority have put this well, that the situation isn't necessarily just drought, right? We are looking at the long-term aridification of the desert Southwest. And so anything that we're doing now to implement, you know, resiliency and adaptation planning around water should not be considered temporary. We're looking at kind of permanent, evolving solutions as we move forward and that need to keep, <laughs> we need to keep moving. Um, so these, you know, these changes in temperature are not just 
periodic droughts and the dryness, it's, it's going to be coming over time. Um, there's obviously a lot of stress happening already on our aquatic systems, our rivers, our streams, you know, many of them are drying up in the summer. Um, and then, you know, groundwater is, is also getting impacted here. There's um, this increase that I've already mentioned about water demand and water supplies for urbanization on top of already stressed systems. Um, that snowmelt um, is also directly related, that snowfall and snowmelt is directly related to the prevalence of wildfires, which have obviously been you know, hugely devastating for those of us in the West and the Southwest. Um, and, you know, the snowmelt is happening earlier and earlier, which allows more time for drying of the, la of the landscape. Um, and so those maximum stream flows are, are hitting and they're just changing the way that our reservoirs and our infrastructure was built, right, to be able to, to access this water. Um, the population growth, um, even though I think on average, urbanization or urban urban uses of water are only you know twenty percent of the water picture in in most states. It varies a little bit state by state, but you know about eighty percent of the water use here in the Southwest is has been associated with agriculture. Um, and so, but even still, that that twenty or so percent increase or a percentage of water use for for domestic use for urban use. Um, even still, that that part is is not insignificant. Um, and and throughout the region, there are all sorts of complicating factors here that make any sort of water policy and water work challenging. Um, and this includes like the different ways in which water rights are administered. They vary state by state, region by region. Um, there is complicating factors in terms of like how those water rights are administered. Um, I live in in New Mexico. And so he, in this part of the country, a lot of tribal communities have senior water rights and the newer users and cities have less senior water rights. So there's a lot of complication of like how that water is, is shared on paper uh, or not. <laughs> and then there's, there's the challenges of how we use land and how we make choices around agriculture. It's hugely challenging, uh, particularly in a place like California where you're producing you know, massive amounts of food for the country but also producing you know, food here in the Southwest that's being exported to China and other places. You know, we have questions about like, what are we using that water for and what specifically are we growing? Um, all of these things are, are, are real challenges that um, have no simple solutions and that are going to be you know, further exacerbated by <laughs> climate change impacts. Um, there's obviously been also a lot of focus on some of the really big water infrastructure and water riverine systems. Um, that exist and that do definitely impact California um, in terms of, you know, water availability. And so the Colorado River flow here, I've got a few graphs um, from uh, the Nevada current um, resource here. It, and, and you can see like there's a lot of change that's happened over the years between river flows reducing, um, temperatures increasing, those two on the left there, related to the Colorado River. And then Lake Powell and Lake Mead are getting a tremendous amount of press <laughs> in terms of like they're at 24% right now and close to Deadpool. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of challenges on these large region-wide watershed, even beyond the watershed infrastructure systems, right? That we have invested in to support many of the communities in the Southwest. And so that's all daunting. <laughs> However, <laughs> there are a lot of really good people working on um, strategies to, to better use water, to recycle water, to update some of those policies, and then also to do what we're gonna talk about today is look at decentralized solutions that are maybe faster and smaller scale, but you know, more nimble in terms of implementation. So um, there's been an evolution in water recycling or water reuse policies. Uh, nationwide and in California. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just setting the context there um, because there's some good changes, I think, on the horizon. And there's um, there's some things that are just use, useful to be aware of uh, for where, where things are going with this water recycling. Um, recognizing that water recycling and water reuse is a direction that almost all of us in the West and the Southwest 
and elsewhere are going to be able to shore up these water supplies that we do have right access to. So they're gonna become increasingly important with the changing climate. Um, the first document or process I'm gonna talk about is um, actually from the US EPA. This is the National Water Reuse Action Plan that was released in the last few years here. And there, it's an ongoing um, process to basically create an, a national EPA level um, coalition of folks working on water recycling policy or water reuse policies. Um, and so there's um, 100 partners collaborating on this um, and looking at many of the barriers that currently exist. Um, they've recognized that you know, climate change is, is challenging communities to have you know, security with their long-term water needs, uh, or even in some cases, short-term. And so reusing wastewater, stormwater for agricultural uses, non-potable or maybe even potable, definitely potable water use um, is, is, is here <laughs> and it's growing. And so um, they, the EPA has recognized that this is really an important part of adaptation and responses to climate change. Um, so that document is available online. There's also an action you know, group and there's a number of topics they continue to work through um, with the idea of trying to make reuse more accessible, more straightforward to implement um, and sensitive to things like climate and environmental justice also. Okay, so that's there's a link there. It's easy to find with a little bit of Googling. Um, next up, I want to talk about the National Blue Ribbon Commission for On-Site Non-Potable Water Systems. This commission has been around since I think, 2017 um, and has been led uh, by the brilliant uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission folks, um, along with the U.S. Water Alliance and the Water Research Federation um, Foundation, excuse me, around you know, determining what are the best practices for water recycling at this decentralized scale. Um, and so they've worked with a coalition of regulators and sta state leaders and technical experts on creating model resources. So model codes and standards and ordinances that can be adopted, guidance on how to develop state and local water reuse programs and non-potable programs. And then, you know, helping to move the ball forward on creating what are called risk-based water quality standards. So standards that are are more sensible and look at the actual risk of non-potable water um, to, to kind of streamline the design and permitting process. Um, interestingly, and maybe and not surprisingly at all, but <laughs> this work is, is directly informing what California is doing uh, right now uh, in terms of adopting um, and create, creating and adopting new non-potable regulations, which I'm gonna talk about here in a moment. So it's really important work. Um, third, there's a, an organization called Water Reuse, and this is a, a national advocacy organization um, dedicated to water reuse. And so they do a lot of policy advocacy in DC. They hold good conferences and they have a fair amount of education and outreach activities. So I bring it up because if you're looking to help convince folks about water reuse and recycling, they're a great resource. Um, I just grabbed a few screenshots here from, from their website. Um, and they also run these really kind of fun and interesting water reuse awards each year. And I grabbed a few here to just show, like they're looking at, you know, who's doing really interesting water reuse work and then elevating that. So some examples are uh, Tucson Water, the utility in Tucson um, is helping to basically use recycled water to help recharge and re get water back through a, a dry riverbed throwing, flowing through downtown. Um, and recognizing that, that the reuse of that water is important from a habitat, wildlife, and open space perspective, while it also recharges groundwater, right? And everything from that to like what One Water Nevada, looking at like high level, you know, package treatment systems doing groundwater recharge. Um, they've highlighted the SoFi Stadium in Hollywood Park uh, in LA there, that's uh, putting in two and a half miles of recycled water piping. Um, and then a project um, in Calabasas looking at um, potable water reuse by putting recycled water into the reservoirs and blending that. So all kinds of interesting different scales and types of projects, um, but water reuse, they're a great group to, to get involved with or to check out if you're interested in, in what's happening with the water reuse <clears throat> world nationally. 
in California, um, there's been some interesting uh, developments. And for anyone who's worked um, or tried to work on water, decentralized water recycling projects in California with wastewater or indoor reuse of water, it can be challenging because there's a, a number of different regulations out there that have not been so well tailored for these smaller scale systems. And so in 2018, Senate Bill 966 passed, which is um, called the On-Site Treated Non-Potable Water Systems <laughs> Bill, with, which is aimed at expanding, expanding that water recycling at that small scale um, to create statewide regulations and streamline that permitting process. And so um, that bill has required the State Water Board uh, to adopt the risk-based standards that I mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> by this December, which was last week. <laughs> I don't know if that's happened quite yet, but it's in process um, for commercial in-building reuse, okay? Um, it's gonna touch on things like pathogen removal, water quality monitoring, reporting, um, and cross-connections. This is gonna apply for gray to gray water systems, um, rainwater, stormwater, black water, condensate, but it, it, it wisely excludes the use of rainwater or gray water for irrigation. So like the irrigation of gray water and rainwater is gonna be kept relatively simple, whereas like indoor reuse of any of those is gonna have this new risk-based standard. Um, it's going to require consultation with the water and sewer providers in the region. Um, and <clears throat> it's gonna lead basically to these regulations for on-site treatment and reuse. Um, they haven't been released yet, but are, are in process. Um, and so by next December, the Department of Housing and Community Development is supposed to be incorporating these into their, um, their own guidelines. So we'll see how that timing works out, but it's, it's in progress. And so this is important to know, <laughs> because if you're designing projects that might be you know, implicated in this, um, it's important to know that these changes are coming. Um, so, and it's also important to know that gray water and rainwater, as I mentioned, um, as long as we're using this for irrigation, they don't fall under this program so much. Um, but any, any systems that are existing when this comes into fruition will be required to comply with these regulations, at least as it's written right now, within two years. So that's important too, because you don't know exactly what they are, and so you have, have to navigate that. Um, so just to summarize that, California is going to make it easier for building scale reuse, okay, and decentralized reuse. Um, through the adoption of those statewide risk-based standards. Um, rainwater and gray water will continue to be most likely regulated at the local level and not have to go through that same process as long as they're used outside for irrigation. Um, the, this is, you know, applies to commercial projects, not single, single family um, residential. So just wanna be clear about that. Um, and, you know, in this process, it's become clear that some, you know, some municipalities, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about this in a minute, why this is, but some municipalities are not in favor of a lot of decentralized reuse. And, and this is because it can remove flow from the collection system, from the sewers, um, which can make corrosion worse and can actually concentrate what's left in there, making it higher concentration, which can create some challenges for the downstream infrastructure. Um, and then for a note of those of you who've wrangled with Title 22. Title 22 is an existing water, like rule making around municipal and larger scale water recycling. That's been hard to comply with because it's written for bigger projects. That's gonna continue in place. Um, and this new non-potable water, you know, water regulations will come in for these smaller projects, which is really one of the reasons they're doing this. So that's all good news. Okay, so decentralized water. Um, this is one of the core topics for today, and I want to talk about how we see this um, as, as a consulting firm focused on a lot of restoration and watershed scale planning, too, um, and then give you a couple of tips and tricks and guidelines about how to think about these systems and a little bit ab about these systems. Um, so why would we be considering decentralized water strategies in the context of adaptation um, or one, one water planning, right? Like there's large infrastructure projects happening. There's um, 
you know, a lot of different pieces and parts coming together here. <laughs> and part of our job as designers, engineers, architects is to help our clients come to the place where they can see if it, you know, if it does make sense to implement these things, why would they do it? Okay. Um, typically, money is not the first driver when it comes to water, right? Like the energy sector and net zero carbon and net zero energy has had a smoother path to um, really making a financial case to drive down the cost of, of energy um, in buildings. The water systems have a longer payback. Um, it's, you know, multiple reasons for that. You know, one of them is that water is underpriced and undervalued. Um, these systems still can be expensive um, as everyone's working out what, what they mean and what they need to be built out of, et cetera. And so making the case for to our clients, to our collaborators is important. And so why do it? <laughs> um, and so sometimes there's softer reasons than the, just the financial piece or just the lead credit, right? So I want to talk a little bit about that um, and help help this group along here because I think it's important that we, we can message this. So um, first off, water has in inherent value, <laughs> okay? There's, there's a lot of, of really eloquent speakers out there from indigenous communities and communities of color and, and folks who, have, who can really speak to like how essential water is, how, how valuable it is when it's clean and it's healthy. It is a really important piece of what we're doing <laughs> is to just understand that. We, we forget because we turn on the tap, we flush the toilet, we forget really how valuable, you know, clean water is, it's essential. Um, on the other hand, also water generates tremendous economic value, particularly in a place like California with the agricultural element uh, and the, and the you know, urban growth and, and all of the economy. Um, and so that's a really important piece. Um, these decentralized strategies help augment that, right? Help, help contribute to that economic engine. Uh, and then third, our surrounding ecosystems, like the, the ecosystems that support our ability to be here in the first place, okay, they also have a need for this water. And so dewatering these landscapes um, is, is devastating. It's got devastating impacts on ecosystems and biodiversity. We've seen streams and rivers dry up. Quality of life for everyone nosedives in that case, right? And it's only going to get worse. We're already seeing these systems highly stressed with climate change. And so anything we can do to reduce that pressure or to increase that water supply within the environment is also really important. There's a, a lot of discussion in the adaptation world about re-wetting and putting this water back into the landscape as best we can in, into the you know, ecosystems that are supporting all of our communities. And so we also think it's important to note, therefore, that the decentralized water strategies is only one part of a broader strategy that we need to be focusing, focusing, focusing on, which is that the nature-based solutions on the whole should be our priority. And this is hard for architects and like any project, any developers who are working on, you know, a, a discrete parcel, a single site, <laughs> um, when, you know, we recognize that like the broader solutions here, you know, can't be just undertaken at the site scale. Um, and, but nonetheless, it's important to be able to explain that to our clients and collaborators that um, we have to be mindful of that and look for opportunities to connect to those other initiatives that are happening in the region. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> so strategies for designers, I would suggest you do not start at the building and say, what can I do with this building? I think you should start at the watershed and the community scale and say, what can we do to make sure that you know, our actions are preserving and protecting places in the first place, like not developing areas that are important for water shed, re, you know, recharge that are important for you know aquifer, uh, you know, protection, etc. Or they're important for water harvesting. And so, protecting, conserving, and restoring is must be a priority. Okay, um, we can do that also through supporting regional projects that prioritize those kind of ecological goals, such as restoration, wetland enhancement and augmentation, and you know, protection and, and restoration of riparian areas. And then we can start to look at opportunities to conserve and recycle water with the on-site systems um, and complementing those municipal infrastructure systems where possible. So this is important to like, just take our view up a little bit higher than just the building in the site scale to make sure that what we're doing is not disrupting these other 
larger watershed type of projects, and in some cases, maybe even you know implementing beneficial outcomes. Um, also, as we're talking about that, we can't forget about the human element here, right, around the equity and environmental justice uh, and community health. There's been terrible decisions that have been made <laughs> that in, in, in urban planning and design that have caused real impacts downstream around flooding, water quality, injustice, um, pollution, you know, for communities that don't have a say in the same way. Um, and so all of those things have to be embedded in the planning and design decisions that we're making at the building and then the watershed scale. Um, and so sourcing and treating and harvesting water uh, is important because it strengthens our communities, but it also protects and restores those ecosystems on which we depend. And if we can find projects that hit those two synergies, I think that, you know we feel pretty confident that that's the direction we need to be going. Um, and so at the building scale, we can transform what we're doing um, to reduce the reliance on potable water that might be coming from, you know, um, a, a fragile ecosystem. Um, we can harvest, treat, reuse water more than one time to, you know, minimize the impacts on where we're discharging to. Um, and in all of our decisions, we have to be, you know, deciding that we are <laughs> going for the long-term game here in that the water stress, the interruption of water supply from climate change, catastrophic fire in our watersheds, uh, et cetera, is, it's no longer like an option. It's really an imperative that we have to be thinking through. So AIA does say a little bit about some of this, and I wanted to just bring that up. The framework for design excellence for water is a couple different areas, topic areas here, um, does talk a little bit about this. And so everything we're discussing today is well, al well aligned with the AIA's framework. So indoor water efficiency, outdoor water use reduction, not using water on our landscapes, at least not potable water, um, reusing process water, capture and reuse of black water and gray water, rainwater and stormwater, and then the idea of moving towards net zero water buildings. You know, what does that mean? So AIA has been looking at this, working on this. The coat top 10 projects usually are those that have a pretty strong water element at least in my experience, um, that's one there on the screen that we did with Methune. It's on the East Coast, but the uh, Chatham Eden Hall campus, a whole campus that was designed um, from the ground up to be a sustainable demonstration of water harvesting and recycling, net zero energy, uh, agricultural implementation. So lots of opportunities here within what AIA is already recognizing and doing, right? Um, wanted to share a little bit of a process that we use. This isn't anything that's like particularly formal, but just some recommendations here of how to look at the decision-making process for what types of projects or infrastructure strategies to implement, right? Um, and so I wanted to get a little bit specific here because I gave the big picture, but like a couple of specific examples. So I just put together a little diagram here with five, five steps and it's probably more like a circle, <laughs> but you know, walk through that. So um, typically we, you know, recommend starting out, you're looking at a project that has, you know, potential for doing something interesting with water, which hopefully every project has something, right? Um, is to identify what you actually need to do and what your goals are. And this is a conversation that should happen very early on um, so that you kind of set that stage, right? And so like, do we need to have outdoor water for irrigation? What are our needs? Do we need to have water-based cooling? Can we find other ways around assumptions sometimes that are embedded that have implications on our water use down the road for a long period of time? Um, what is our access to municipal water? What is our access to municipal sewer? Um, what does our client want? What are their goals? Do we wanna pursue lead or living building? What does the community expect for a project like this? And so just stopping for a moment and asking about what's actually needed and what those goals might be is a good place to start before any kind of design. <laughs> um, and then right in step with that perhaps is this idea also step two here, of researching and trying to much more deeply understand the, the water of place. We've heard about story of place, right? But we call this the water of place, like what, is the watershed story of your project. 
Um, and this is maybe one of the most critical pieces that I think is missed when we make decisions about we're gonna harvest rain or we're gonna recycle this, that, or the next thing, all of which can be fine. But this part of understanding the water of place is what can really, I think, elevate the project and ground <laughs> its, you know, its systems. Um, and I'm gonna critique a little bit here, like sometimes lead and living buildings say that you should do X, Y, or Z, but it may or may not make sense to do that in your particular watershed with the story of water of that particular place. So let me give an example here. So, you know, there are some places where water scarcity is gonna be the main driver. Like it's just not gonna be enough water <laughs> or there are real risks to that. And so absolutely understanding that piece is, is important so that you know where you're going to target. And so the first thing you might target is like, well, we're not gonna use water to flush toilets. We're not gonna use water to irrigate the landscape. And so what does that mean? Because we know that we have to go after that scarcity issue. Um, other places, water's not scarce, but water quality is important. You know, Maybe you're in a combined sewer uh, where all your stormwater and wastewater is mixed. Maybe you're in a watershed that has really bad water pollution happening. Um, that's leading to the Chesapeake Bay. Other, you know, there's different parts of the country, even different parts of California will have different conditions here. And so, so your water quality type of project might be different than your water scarcity project. Um, similarly, these projects, if they're in a highly urban area, are going to have a mix of sewer sheds and infrastructure. What, what is the condition of that stuff? Is the wastewater treatment plant awesome or is it terrible? <laughs> um, you know, is it gonna get a major upgrade or is it really having a hard time? You know, um, it's important to understand where's the water coming from, where's it going? What's the condition of that infrastructure? And is there anything in there that your project can contribute to those greater goals? Okay, and so that's important. It's also important to know that like, there are some places like where I live in Santa Fe that like our discharge from our wastewater treatment plant supports the entire Santa Fe River. If we, if we were to discharge less water, it really could have serious impacts on the aquatic species and our downstream you know, irrigators and ecosystems in groundwater recharge. And so you know, being able to discharge our water into the river so it can continue on is important here. Some places that it's gonna be different, right? So, but just understanding that like uh, there are ecosystems and whole watersheds that de depend on some of the discharges that we have. And so, Sometimes it doesn't make sense to interrupt that. City of Las Vegas is like that. They recycle all of their water, you know? And so they don't even allow decentralized water systems because they just, they get it all back. And so there's, you have to, these are the really important things to understand to ground the project. And I cannot emphasize this enough. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's improving our collective ecological uh, literacy when it comes to these, you know, water systems. Okay, once you've done that and you've got a good sense of the story, then it's time to start looking at some numbers and understanding like a water balance for the project. This is step three. So quantifying, how much water do I have? How much might we need? And looking at that in a couple of different ways, there's some great tools out there for that. Um, understanding what your footprints might be, your capacity on your site, uh, and then what climate change might do to that. And then the next, the last two phases look a little more similar to typical design projects, right? Where you're starting to look at a preliminary design and pricing um, and looking at what the life cycle costs might be. Sometimes they're really not great, <laughs> but understanding what is that from a water perspective in the long run? Um, are there incentives regionally? There's be, been increasing incentives for gray water, rainwater and wastewater systems available to developers or private entities. Um, and public entities, um, you know, what kind of things do I need to do from a technology perspective? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to manage and treat water. You know, what makes the most sense for my project? Um, what can I get through the regulatory agencies? What's the, what's the code requirements? Um, what is my operations requirement in the long run? And is my client prepared to do that? <laughs> so all of that is pretty important to understand and dig into in the preliminary design phase so that you have set that those expectations, right? And then in the final in the final stage here of this process, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to be getting into the more typical things like construction documentation and um, permitting, and and then you know making sure everything is built properly. 
um, and then training operators. So that's the arc of a typical project. The ones I'll show you today, I went through that arc. <laughs> um, but you know, I thought it was important to at least show this in some way because I feel like a lot of us miss steps one and two <laughs> in there. And so this is important um, part of what we need to be doing. Okay, so a little bit about these project, uh, the the technologies here. I'm going to dig into those a little bit. Um, I've mentioned the scale of water recycling. There are, you know, municipal and community scale projects. They're increasingly common in California. In fact, probably the most common of all of any state. Right? California is a leader in this. Has been a leader in this. Will continue to be a leader in municipal and community scale water recycling. Um, Decentralized scales, which we're talking about today, are those building and district scales, um, preferably in cases where you don't have access to those recycled water systems that the municipalities are building. Um, and there's many places that don't have access to that. Um, and so, or at least not yet. And so that's where this decentralized work really comes in. A couple um, just notes about water recycling. Okay. so. When a drop of water falls on a natural environment, that water is used in, in many ways, right? In, in, and um, you know, it might create you know, shade through growing trees. It might you know, move, move nutrients down through the soil. There's, there's different things that that drop of water will do. And it might run off and support the, the creek or the river downstream, et cetera. Um, we need to think about decentralized water systems in a similar way. Um, because this is important as water recycling becomes more integrated at a municipal scale. So what I mean by this is that if we harvest and reuse wastewater or gray water, which is like water we've already you know, flushed and used, if we use that for, for toilets or indoor use, that is considered non-consumptive. Like we've taken that same drop of water, we used it once, we clean it, we recycle, we use it again. Um, it doesn't go away per se. It allows us to use that water more than one time. Um, if we use that same drop of water for irrigating the landscape or putting in a cooling tower, um, that is considered consumptive use because it that drop of water does not return to the water cycle in any short-term scale. It's evaporated pretty much or used by the plants, but evaporated. Um, and so that's consumptive, even though that can offset the use of fresh, clean potable water for cooling or for irrigation. So it offsets, but it's it's considered consumptive. And so sometimes it's important to know, like, do I need a consumptive or a non-consumptive project? Um, and so that's, that's just an important distinction to make. And then there's this other option of putting the water into the ground, <laughs> okay? Like treating it and putting it into the ground, recharging that water, um, and that can benefit groundwater supplies. And so that can be beneficial too. Um, most decentralized projects don't discharge to creeks or streams or rivers. We're not going back to the water cycle that direct, going into the ground or reusing that water. I just thought this was important to highlight. Um, I'm gonna talk through a handful of strategies, specific kinds of technologies, to show some pictures here. And I picked some that, some are gonna be familiar, some maybe not so much. So I'm gonna walk through those. Um, I'm gonna talk about toilets and particularly alternatives to toilets some composting, some vacuum flush, gray water and wastewater, um, which allows us to use that water more than one time. Um, rainwater harvesting, which basically helps us create new water <laughs> uh, and offset demand. And then stormwater and site issues where we can sink and store that water in the soils, uh, slowly re you know, releasing that to the downstream. Examples are bioretention, permeable paving, and and the idea of hollow landscapes. And actually, I'm not going to talk about that one in here, but I'm going to show that in the last um, uh, project profile so you see that. Okay, so first off, this idea of um, water efficiency is, is usually where we start when we're looking at uh, these decentralized strategies. Water efficiency is, is an excellent <laughs> first pass. Which is why the um, the idea of performing a water balance is important because you can see like what's the impact if I'm doing if you know just the the impact of more efficient fixtures um, or some of these other strategies how can I compare these things to the baseline building um, what synergies do I need to look for 
uh, and what you know kinds of opportunities might I have for for offsetting some of these costs? And so water balances, I, I mentioned that earlier, is like a way for us to quantify with math, you know, what are we doing? Uh, and what's the potential here and what's really not a potential. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's tools online for this. You can do this with Excel, but the idea of, of, of looking at that is important for that water efficiency piece so that you know that you're investing well <laughs> in your infrastructure. Um, the toilets, I'm gonna highlight, I'm not gonna talk about like some of the other water efficiency fixtures that are out there, fixtures. Um, those are constantly improving, but I wanna talk about toilets. This one's a little less obvious. Um, and this really helps us avoid the use of clean, potable drinking water for conveying sewage. You could do th these types of toilets on a project and do nothing else, and you could have some significant water savings if your building is toilet flushing dominated. Okay, so these can be combined with like just regular sewers <laughs> if you wanted to, right? Um, they don't they don't have to be linked to other systems, though they can be, um, and so. Best application of these alternative toilets are, are new construction, where you can um, really make sure that the systems are designed in properly, and specifically in projects where you have a high flushing demand. So, you know, commercial buildings where most of your water is is toilet flushing, for example. Um, technologies are evolving. The vacuum flush drives down the water use without the need for composters. The, I'll show you. You can connect them to composters if you want to. Um, the effluent that can come out, though, is also highly concentrated, um, and so there's special considerations that need to be, you know, just thought thought through. Um, and they do have some specialized maintenance. So here's some pictures of composting toilets. The ones on the left there are um, in the basements of the Candida Building in Georgia, uh, in Atlanta. This composter is connected to foam flush toilets. On the right there, those foam flush toilets look like a normal toilet, but they use like a soap with um, just a few tablespoons of water to make them go. Um, and then vacuum flush toilets use a little bit of water too, but they, the plumbing is kept at like a negative pressure. This, this unit here actually like creates a suction <laughs> on the toilet. And so it, it pulls the water um, and the waste out to its wherever it's going, to the sewer or in some cases to composters. Um, and so these systems have become more common in commercial facilities where we're really able to flush water with very small volumes. Related to that, <laughs> um, it's not exactly a toilet, but it's related to this, is the idea that we can also be harvesting nutrients from our toilet systems. So we can be diverting urine and we can be recovering and making fertilizer. I'm going to talk about that one here in just a bit. Um, this is a evolving, but we have, there are toilets that separate urine. There are urinals that can be sent directly to urine collection, and then that can be turned into a saleable fertilizer product. Okay, so that's efficiency. I want to talk about water reuse just briefly here. Gray water and wastewater are the two most obvious ones here that allow us to use water more than one time. Um, we would capture that water, treat it, variety of uses. There's a lot out here on this. I'm not gonna dive too much into the construction or the technologies, but just a few highlights here. Um, the best applications for gray water and wastewater systems are still like new construction um, where the, the wastewater or gray water generation is high. This tends to be residential projects more so than commercial. So the, the alternative toilets are great for commercial. This water recycling and reuse is great for, for non-commercial where you have high volumes of gray water, for example. Um, that allow you uh, maybe a more dilute water stream, easier to treat. Um, you can do this on commercial facilities, but it's, you know, residential facilities use a lot of water. So these are good um, places for that. Um, there's a lot of systems that have failed that might not be on a sanitary sewer, uh, that are polluting groundwater, that are outdated. So these systems are great for repairs or upgrades. Your, your retreat centers, your hospitality projects, really good. Um, and then, you know, in if you can find a match where your flushing demand is, is you know, high, high too, you can recycle this water to meet the, that flushing. Um, but a few things to consider. If recycled water is available from the municipality, you should connect to it. <laughs> Don't try to treat your own wastewater. Connect to what they're providing uh, and encourage that implementation. Double plumb all your buildings to be connected, even if it's maybe a few years down the road for that coming, right? Um, 
These systems do require specialized maintenance, but as I mentioned before, the regulations are moving and getting more and more streamlined um, and standardized. So that's really good. A um, couple of examples here, I'll talk about gray water first, just a high level here. <laughs> gray water is, um, you know, sinks, not non-kitchen sinks. So bathroom sinks, showers, laundry. Um, it can be suitable for toilet flushing and irrigation. There's lots of different ways to treat it. You can put it outside and hide it. You can create living systems with it. Yeah, you usually have some back end mechanical filtration and disinfection. Right, so this is just a couple of examples there. Um, right now, California does have um, a gray water allowance in the California Plumbing Code, chapter 15. Put the reference here. You have to look it up. It's got a lot in there. Um, but it, it basically allows uh, for residential and commercial requirements to be slightly different. Um, that covers simple and complex gray water systems, um, primarily aimed at irrigation reuse. Um, those um, future on-site non-potable regulations I talked to before will likely supersede this when it comes to indoor reuse, but that's still a few years off. Um, but just wanted to point that out. And I put this little map on here. Those orange dots are gray water systems that we've installed like in the LA area, greater LA area um, that have been put through this plumbing code. And so primarily for irrigation, but a few multifamily indoor toilet flushing. Um, so this, it's around, there's a fair amount of this in California, right? Um, and there's nothing to say you can't continue designing these a couple of gu guidelines here about that. And so, um, it's pretty well spelled out in the plumbing code. And um, you know, for going to outdoor irrigation, it makes sense. Um, it's important to note that in, in some areas though, you are gonna start to see pushback from municipalities that don't always love the gray water recycling to irrigation because it's consumptive and you lose the dilution in the collection system, as I mentioned. And so wastewater strengths are getting higher at the treatment plants from all this water conservation and reuse. And then it's 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 causing some problems in the sewer systems, which were not designed for these lower flows, higher concentrated values. So it's important to know that these can have this work can have impacts on the municipal system. It's good to understand that and, and you know ideally work through that with them. Um, okay, so that's gray water. Wastewater is usually considered like gray water plus all the toilets and the kitchens, the black water, right? So this is, you know, a handful of technologies out there. I just, I'm not getting into detail today on this one, but here's just some examples. This is back at Chatham, Chatham University here, of, you know, natural treatment systems or uh, this mechanical systems. There's all kinds of different ways to treat that water to the levels <clears throat> suitable for toilet flushing or irrigation or groundwater recharge. And so wastewater projects are less common in urban areas, but are much more common where you need to have decentralized solutions where you don't have a sewer, right? And so it's a whole topic unto itself. <laughs> um, rainwater, as well as harvesting um, kind of unconventional water, uh, like condensate from cooling systems um, or sometimes like foundation dewatering. So this idea of, of like new water that isn't coming from the municipality. Um, best applications for that also tend to be new construction particularly if you have consistent rainfall. Um, you can retrofit you know, rainwater systems in, in places where you can actually access the plumbing um, for the roof drains. Um, it's, it's really a nice fit if you can meet your irrigation demands and get your landscapes off of potable water. Um, and, and in some cases, you know, even in desert environments where you don't get a lot of rainfall, it still can be valuable um, if your water supply is highly constrained. So, um, it can be expensive. Underground storage is definitely not in, inexpensive. Um, but in some places you can get credit for stormwater, uh, you know, mitigation with cisterns and rainwater systems. Um, and we're also seeing more increasing use of that water for, for potable use. Um, and so here's just a typical schematic uh, for you know, harvesting for non-potable. Um, you're gonna have you know, storage and mechanical filtration equipment. Okay, and, and repressurization. So there's some complexity that even exists with the rainwater system. It's just important to know and to allow space uh, and time for that kind of thing. So a couple of images 
you know, pretty, this is not new stuff, right? So cisterns, you know, we sometimes put the equipment behind glass so you can see it and like it's not hidden, right? Um, there's options for retrofitting in parking garages is an interesting one or stacked with solar systems. Um, there's underground solutions, obviously, too, but getting creative about where we store water. Um, at the Candida building, um, the, the cistern is under is in the foundation of the building, so you walk right over it in the main foyer, um, and then all the plumbing to get to it is exposed in the ceiling, and it's labeled, so you can kind of like see where the water is going, so it's cool opportunities like that. And then um, in the you know, it, particularly in the Candida building too, we also put everything so it was visible so you could see where all the water filtration and what, you know, making the clean water is happening. That, this particular project, it's drinking water from, from rain. Um, condensate is another one of those ones that's available. It, ha it has to be, um, you know, treated properly because it can be kind of a, a strange water source in terms of its corrosivity and its um, bacterial load, but condensate can be used. Okay, so okay, so those are the the main water strategies. Um, and if I haven't put you to sleep, I'm going to now show you some cool case studies um, that will bring this stuff hopefully to life. And I've got two to run through, and um, I'm going to do the first one as the main case study, and then the last one I'll just touch on briefly. So um, this project is called the PAE Living Building. It's a new facility in Portland, Oregon. Uh, completed this last year. It is targeting the full living building challenge. Living building challenge is a you know aspirational green building standard that's administered by the International Living Future Institute. It's a very high high level of performance for water, energy, materials, etc. Um, the the project is not yet certified, but it's targeting that full living building, hopefully in 2023. Um, the project was designed by ZGF Architects, along with PAE, who is the client operator or, or um, the occupant, really. PAE are mechanical engineers who've designed a lot of living buildings. So this is their office. Um, interestingly, though, it's private. It was a private speculative office development. Um, through a partnership of a handful of players here, the Downtown Development Group, PAE, Edlin and Company, ZGF, Walsh Construction and Apex Real Estate. So interesting structure that way. Um, it's five stories tall, 58,000 square feet mixed use. It's located on a former parking lot, so it's Brownfield. Uh, yeah. Net positive energy and net positive water were essential goals here. The, project is designed to produce more electricity than it needs. It collects all of its own potable water and it treats all of its wastewater on site. And um, they were pretty insistent on having a financial you know, return here um, to, to really push that idea of replicability and something that is financially solvent. This is partly why <clears throat> PAE chose to you know, do this, this project. Um, it is a mass timber building. Um, it has uh, you know, a number of office spaces, open spaces, gathering spaces. Um, the goal for lifespan of the project was 500 years. Their goal was to vastly exceed the 50 to 100 year, you know, lifetime you might see a conventional building. Um, and as, so far as, as I know, and that they have said, it's the world's first developer driven and also the largest commercial living building um, that's there, that's out there. Um, they have some stats here that I that I obtained from PAE themselves, but they the materiality of it is really clean. They um, they have two thousand seven hundred thirty seven items that were vetted to be red list free, so free of toxins, free of you know materials that we don't really want in the buildings. They diverted almost two thousand tons of material from the landfill. Um, they've got some stats here on the two thousand tons of embodied carbon uses about. 180,000 gallons of water a year. And they're projecting an increase in productivity of their staff of between two and 5%, kind of an important piece. Um, so the living, living building challenge has seven pedals um, that these buildings have to achieve. So place, water, energy, health and happiness, materials, <clears throat> equity, and beauty. I'm gonna talk just about the water part today, but there's 
a really great um, tour on PAE's website and, and ZGF has information. There's a lot out there. This project's been winning all kinds of cool awards. Um, <clears throat> but from the water side of things, let's talk about that here for a moment. This building was designed to have 250 occupants. So we've got um, decent, decent, you know, staffing in there. There's a 71,000 gallon cistern under the slab that serves as both water harvesting infrastructure, about 50,000 gallons for that. And, and then the other 20,000 gallons as a modulator for stormwater. So you get stormwater credit out of this cistern also. Um, the wastewater systems were designed for about a thousand gallons a day. And the building has a extensive composting toilets uh, and vacuum with the vacuum flush toilets, and then also a nutrient recovery system. Um, so all of the water is provided by rainwater. And so there's a rainwater harvesting to potable. So the rooftop is covered with solar panels and uh, water safe membranes on the top. It comes down to that cistern under the slab. Um, the first floor of the building, some of the first floor of the building is used to hold the water infrastructure. Uh, many of these commercial buildings have it in the basement, but in this case, it's actually all on the first floor and the storage tanks are under the slab. So this is a base, this is a basement free building. Um, in that first floor treatment area, that um, water is made, potable water is made for the building uh, through treatment skid. And I'll show you some pictures of that here in a moment. Um, and then that potable water is used to flush all the toilets and supply water to all the sinks and all the uses in the building. Um, the exception is that fire suppression comes from the municipal system. And that's allowable in the living building challenge and, and pretty typical. If you have access to fire supply, you use that. Um, let's see, the wastewater is generated from sinks, hand washing sinks. There's actually a kitchen sink, some you know uh, dishwasher. So there is, it's, it's mostly gray water, but there's a little bit of like kitchen, kitchen waste here. And so there's a little wastewater treatment unit in the basement and that recycles the water um, actually up to, that's the primary source for flushing the fixtures, flushing the toilets and flushing the urinals. Rainwater can be used for that, but the wastewater is the primary um, source. Um, the water footprint of this building is driven down really low because of the, um, the vacuum toilets. And, and then composters. So we don't have a high flushing volume in the first place. Composting toilets um, are, are treating the solid waste. And then if any leachate gathers in those, it overflows to the nutrient harvesting system, which I'll talk about in a second. And then all the urinals go directly to what we call the urine tank. So we're actually harvesting urine in this building from the urinals and then the overflow from the, from the composter. And that's, a, I think, probably one of the first in the country, one of these systems where this building is going to be making fertilizer. Um, the things that leave the building. <clears throat> so we have overflow to the storm when the cistern gets too full. And, and it's designed to do that, to modulate those peak flows. Um, any unused treated water is discharged to the sanitary system, but it's clean. And then we are able to actually produce a fertilizer product. Uh, two products um, from that nutrient recovery system. So what's it look like inside? So this is that first floor mechanical room. We have um, the cistern underneath there with the pumps inside. There's the treatment skid for potable water there on the left. And then a series of progressive filters and carbon that, that clean that water to a high level, filter out taste, out, you know, make sure it's buffered and out, you know, has alkalinity in it. It's disinfected with ultraviolet and stored in a day tank, um, which allows that to then boost up to the building. Um, we're buffering the pH, and there's the booster pumps. Um, there's an inlet screen here that helps um, just reduce um, stuff from the roof and gunk. <laughs> Here's the wastewater system. Uh, this is a, a textile filter. It's in the basement. It's a pod, uh, pre-made, pre-manufactured by Renko. Um, and there's some water diversion structures to kind of move that around and filter, disinfect, um, and send that back up into the building. These are the composters. There's, I think there's 18 units down there. Um, those are the composting toilets that are fed by those vacuum toilets. So very low flow. 
series of, of toilets there. Um, and, and then the leachate that is collected as well. Um, right now, these have not yet had to be emptied and no leachate has overflown, <laughs> uh, over, you know, overflowed. Uh, so we've got, you know, probably next summer, going to remove some of that compost and take it to a regional farm and it'll be considered a class B biosolids and applied as, as allowed there for that. Um, nutrient recovery. Okay, this part is interesting because this is the idea of actually taking the waste from the building and beginning to reuse them um, to create a product of value. So this project's actually gonna sell fertilizer from the P of engineers, which I think is just pretty fun. And part of the idea here is that nitrogen in urine and phosphorus in urine is one, it's pretty easy to recover from the urinals and from the leachate. And two, it's one of the biggest polluters of, of water. When, it, when If we release that, that nitrogen to wastewater treatment systems or even try to treat it on site, um, it's, it takes four times as much energy typically to get the nitrogen out as it does the carbon. And so it's, um, it's not, you know, and it's also one of the you know, water pollution you know, concerns of, of nitrate pollution in our rivers and streams and groundwater. And so this interrupts this cycle of, of, of spending all of this energy and effort to remove nitrogen from wastewater. And if we don't remove it, like having it discharged into the environment, which is not desirable, this you know, is like a different paradigm where we don't put that in the waste stream in the first place. <laughs> and so if you keep it concentrated, like in the urine tank, uh, the high strength tank there, and you buffer it and through a, a mechanical, it's like a, it's like a, um, you can, I have a photo of it here coming up. It's like a, a, a reactor <laughs> distillation column. Um, we're able to produce two fertilizer products. So an ammonium solution, which is a nitrogen liquid fertilizer, and then a struvite powder, which is a solid form uh, phosphorus uh, powder. And then the only thing that comes out is some liquid waste uh, brine and it has no nutrients in it. It's a little salty. So what's that look like? Here's, here's the distillation tower. And it's a batch system that once we get enough urine, they run this system and uh, it produces the fertilizer. So they're getting close enough, they told me today, to being able to start selling uh, the fertilizer from this building. Here's what it looks like. Um, and so super pure. Um, you can see the distillate there versus the raw urine. <laughs> and then on the right is the struvite product. That's the, the phosphorus. So 100% you know, recovering the nutrients. This particular case, 100% rainwater fed, 100% wastewater derived and carbon free. So it's a really cool, cool offset. Um, right now, producing nitrogen fertilizers can be a very intensive process, like conventionally, right? We make a lot of it for um, agricultural use. And so this is a, a, a kind of proof and concept, right? At a pilot scale of doing this. This type of system has been scaled up and is, is, is becoming more commonly used at like municipal wastewater treatment plants, particularly the production of struvite, getting that phosphorus back out. Right now, phosphorus is mined from the earth that we may have even hit peak phosphorus. It's a very destructive process to get that phosphorus. And so starting to recover phosphorus from wastewater at different scales is, is desirable. So that's what this is demonstrating. Okay, and then I'm gonna just close with a, a, a project that was a retrofit just to demonstrate, you know, that's new construction, interesting, very cool. But we can also go back in and really have significant impacts by uh, modifying uh, existing projects that were not built with some of these concepts in mind. And so this one um, has been around for a handful of years here in Albuquerque. Um, it was a pilot project for the Sustainable Sites Initiative. It was a, a renovation through the, uh, the General Services, GSA, um, to retrofit an, an, a late 1990s federal courthouse that had some pretty water wasting landscaping going on. Um, and was designed to be, you know, ecologically place-based and evocative um, within the Rio Grande Valley there. And so the original courthouse had a big fountain out front, spray irrigation of turf grass over top of a parking garage. It was surrounded by acres of large, impervious, hot sidewalks um, and a lot of turf grass and, um, you know, just 
very urban heat island situation going on here. The front plaza was devoid of really anything. And underneath all of that is the parking, but it was just turf grass and trees. The trees were all dying from over irrigation to hit the turf grass demand, and it was leaking into the parking garage below. So <laughs> working with Rios in LA, uh, and then we did the, the water strategies here. Um, we came up with this, this pilot project that would really dramatically change this situation <laughs> to improve the water storage and water management, um, adding stormwater, um, excuse me, adding rainwater harvesting from the roof and a totally reimagined landscape so that we could be using primarily harvested water and drought and desert tolerant plants um, to be able to you know, reimagine this courtyard as somewhere people would actually want to be. Um, they cut out a quarter acre of that sidewalk making a much more pervious situation and then reused it all to build a series of site walls and terraces that allow water to kind of slowly be held and cascade down the site. Um, we did a lot of soil improvement. We had to replace all the soil on site. So really rebuilt. Um, so from before this kind of you know, turf grass tree dominated to right here at planting using that recycled aggregate um, to create a much more you know, diverse environment. Um, Overall, a focus on native plantings, driving down that irrigation demand, 20,000 gallons of rainwater cisterns to basically irrigate all of this um, and, and you know, basically build, build the soils to, to vastly improve the situation and reduce the runoff of stormwater here going straight to the Rio Grande by, by allowing rain gardens and that terracing to actually double as stormwater management. Um, and so there was a lot of attention paid also to this idea of urban ecology here in a very hot place, bringing in um, pollinators and habitat um, that had much more biodiversity happening than the turf grass and the trees, uh, and then reusing and salvaging most of the materials we needed to do it on site. The net impact was that a retrofit project with cisterns in this landscape change reduced the water demand that the outdoor water demand by 75%, reduced the runoff leaving this site, un, which was previously untreated direct to the Rio Grande by 90%, um, reduced the leaking and the stress on the, um, on the parking garage underneath, supported the trees that we were able to leave in place um, and reduced 21,000 square feet of heat island type paving <laughs> uh, and got a big increase in the habitat diversity uh, the native plants uh, the, and the amount of shade that's on that site. Okay, so that is the end and left some time here for questions and discussion. So thank you, thank you again for having me today. Thank you so much, Erin. That was very detailed. Uh, let's go into the Q and A. Okay, um, since the Colorado River is so important to the water supply of several major urban areas, what serious conservation measures are being implemented in the desert cities such as Phoenix and Las Vegas? Okay, I'm gonna speak about Las Vegas because I'm most familiar with that. Um, and Las Vegas gets a bad rap, right? As this water wasting, Oasis. And there's some truth in that, right? It's very showy. However, they have been, I would say, probably more committed than most places because it's mission critical to the idea of water conservation and water infrastructure investments. So one of the things that they've done that has been really important, they've done a number of things, but one of them is that they recognized early on that most, like the highest percentage of their water demand or a very high percentage of it is outdoor water. So like lawns, grass, landscape, et cetera. And so they have just progressively dialed down what's allowed. They have just removed, you know, turf grass, you know, landscape conversion. What I just showed like in Albuquerque, that is a big part of it. Much of the Southwest was developed without this in mind, like people growing grass and golf courses and all this stuff. And so just by reducing that, which is non-trivial, it takes minds, get changed minds and mindsets and things like that. Um, has a, a major impact. And so I think what I heard from them last week or week before is that right now they have now outlawed all what they call non-functional turf, I think is what it's called. Um, and so they're still allowed to have some grass in parks in areas that are like used by the public, but you can't have like just like a strip of grass 
an exterior, you know, store or whatever, like all of that non-functional turf is, has, is outlawed basically. And, and a lot of restrictions on when you can water and how that watering is done. Tons of incentive programs to help people offset the cost of installing, you know, new landscaping. They actually come in and pay people. <laughs> um, and so they've been, they're, they're, they're the model, I would say in many ways to look at. Um, and they've complemented that with this large water recycling process, which they basically treat all the wastewater and they put it back in the Lake Mead, mix it, <laughs> take it back out. And so they have what's relatively closed loop, right? So that they're not um, discharging downstream. And so that basin, they, they receive, I think the number I heard was only two or 3% of the allotment of the Colorado River flow, not very much. And they do a ton with it. And so um, I think, you know, they're a model. Um, that said, there's a pretty high energy penalty for that <laughs> cost, right? Of treating and pumping and moving all of that water. So it's not free. There's a, car there's a carbon implication of that. And so there's this balance of like, how do we spend our energy wisely also? And how can we offset that with renewables? But I'd say Las Vegas is a good example um, and maybe one of the most extremes, but I, the city of LA is gonna be doing water recycling. Um, you know, and so there's infrastructures to reuse, but then, you know, driving down outdoor water use, driving down superfluous water use, changing the culture of the place so that the people who are coming maybe from not the Southwest, um, who are moving here <laughs> that have images of green grass and all this, that's got, that's got to stop, right? And so a lot of these places are, are really working on that. And I have found in my experience, like, all these water divisions and water departments are very sharp. They are really, they see what's coming, they know what's coming and they're working on, um, you know, how to support that and bring, bring the public along. Okay. Um, I do wanna let people know that um, it looks like we have plenty of time for questions, but um, if there are any questions in the Q&A that are not answered live, um, Aaron will be answering them uh, offline and they'll be sent out. Uh, so let's go to the next question, which is, Please expand on what it takes to double plumb a building beyond the running additional piping. Right. Okay. So um, the plumbing code is going to be a good tip for that because they're going to explain what's required. Um, and so main considerations are things like um, having proper cross connection control. So that there's no risk of accidentally sometime now or in the future of connecting your non-potable water supply, like your rainwater or your treated wastewater into the drinking water system. Um, and so cross connection control from like the whole way along um, is, is critical and is a requirement in the California plumbing code and most other plumbing codes um, that, uh, you know, test and verify that you don't have any of those cross connections. Um, that includes things like using what's called purple pipe, like literally the color purple has been designated for the, the piping and the plumbing and the valves and the containment for um, any of these non-potable water systems. So that even like visually, the plumbing is not uh, so easily conf confused with potable water plumbing. Um, and there's two ways of double, there's two sides of the double plumbing thing. So one is, double plumbing back to the buildings, that non-potable system, right? So that you can supply toilets with it. There's also the double plumbing in some cases of gray water that's, you know, if you wanted to grab laundry, like a commercial laundry facility or, you know, set, like multifamily housing, you could look at the laundry is actually a good consideration to double plumb gray water out from that, for example. Um, and, and the way that like, so San Francisco has some, some good um, rulemaking around this that, you know, all of large enough buildings, there's an ordinance that requires that they already come double plumbed, um, even if the recycled water isn't yet available. And then that, and that the meter to the street is there. And so that when it comes time to hook up these buildings, there's not this massive retrofit issue, right? And so similar to the early days when solar was still expensive and people made their buildings PV ready, you know, put in the chases and the electrical connections, it's the same thing right now with buildings. We should be double, we should be double plumbing buildings for recycled water, period. <laughs> you know, so that they're ready, the recycled water ready, even if you don't have it yet, or even if you can't recycle it yet. If there's any chance of it coming, you should double plumb the building. Okay. 
And have they have they done any data collection for the PAE building in terms of how much energy is used for all of those water treatment systems, especially the urine and solid waste treatment systems? Wonder how efficient they are. Assume all those are done with the energy collected slash produced by the building itself. Right. Okay. So I'll answer the last part of that first. Yes, the building produces all of its own energy, including any energy that is needed for the water infrastructure. Um, the I didn't talk about the energy system, but what I will say is that Portland is not sunny, right? Not all the time, not enough. And so they have their rooftop is covered in solar and they also purchased offsite solar panels that they installed on an affordable housing project. The affordable housing project gets to keep the net benefit of that, but it also offsets the energy. So they use two different rooftops, just to clarify that. Um, kind of interesting way to do it where you don't have enough sunlight. Um, and yes, so they offset all of the energy. I do not know, right? The energy is metered by, by area. So yes, that will be something they will have an idea about, but I do not offhand know where that currently stands. Um, though my understanding is that they're far net positive on the energy side, like not even close. <laughs> and also the building has like coming out of the pandemic, people have not been fully back to work yet, right? So like there's, I think uh, like the Candida building had struggled with this too. They had to go through certification during the pandemic when like people disappeared. So like there's, there's also that like ramping up to get that building up to its full occupancy is still happening right now. But my understanding is that <clears throat> they're gonna actually have me, you know, demonstrations of that, the, that even on the website, I think will become available to like see how the building is doing with its consumption of power and then its generation. Okay. Uh, when will we see the new water reuse and policy in the new code? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Some of our staff have been involved on some of the early commission, like early um, committees, to help look at that. And you know, the date they had was December first, like last week. Um, but we don't know, and so we haven't uh, checked in with them to see. But it's it should be soon. But it, it's it's still the way I understand it is it will still be a while out before it becomes actually implemented because the deadline for actually getting into the codes is next December. What are your thoughts about the atmospheric river storms, for example, the large storms that we are receiving uh, sporadically? The frequency of these storms seem to be increasing over time per USGS. With resiliency in mind, how can we utilize these storms to capture the water, treat it, hold it, and reuse later? Any thoughts? Yeah, it's you know it's similar here in, in where I live, where we're getting... Um, I think we had one of the most intense, biggest monsoonal storm, like summers we've had in a long time. <laughs> and so the irony is, is that in some cases we might get, you know, the precipitation totals might not, might not change, but they might come in big bursts. And so, um, you know, storage is one significant strategy that we have at our disposal. There's a cost to it. It's mostly a first cost of building larger storage cisterns and tanks so that we can take advantage of these big storms that come. Um, this is a desert strategy also. Um, you know, most places that have these kind of more swing type of climates need to invest in large cisterns. Like that cistern in Portland is 70,000 gallons. It rains a lot in Portland, but it does not rain in the summer. <laughs> so that one's got to carry time everybody through. Right. And so in the Candida building in Georgia, 50,000 gallons, big cistern, because we have to take advantage of when the, when it does rain to be able to bridge droughts. And so larger storages are a resiliency measure. Um, the first cost is low. There is some you know, maintenance that's needed to maintain the water quality and water age over time. And so looking at things like incorporating a little bit of an ozone loop or like a small draw that goes through some aeration to kind of help maintain the water quality and the aesthetic characteristics, uh, characteristics like smell and odor, is, taste is, imp is important. Okay. Um, have you worked on projects where subsequent ecological or community scale changes have resulted in needing to reconsider a previous water solution for a site or building? Where changes within the watershed have happened? 
Um, not that I can think of offhand or not that we're aware of um, that we've had to been asked to come back and change something. Um, I would say there's a few that are in the pipeline where those are questions we're actively asking. Um, and, and some of those main changes have to do primarily with um, combined sewer sheds where conventional knowledge is you take the storm water out of combined sewers to avoid overfilling them during storm events and then overflowing them with sewage mixed in. Um, in some of those cases, we've been looking at the idea of taking the wastewater out, <laughs> so removing the pollutants right where we can. And so that's one that we we think is is maybe could change as time goes on. And if sewers are separated, right, a lot of our sewers are kind of getting replaced. So that might be one one example. But I can't. I'm not aware of any offhand where we've had to go back and change something. Not saying it's not possible. It certainly yeah. is. Yeah, it seems like water's a very slow moving. Target. So when you, if you decide on a solution, it's not going to like readily change, I guess, if it's, if it's implemented within a couple of years. Um, what can the municipal sewer systems do to mediate the reduced flow? Really good question <laughs> um, in terms of, of, of that. So I think um, some of the question is what do they do for um, the treatment plants? Because as the municipalities are moving towards recycled water, they are, you know, having to design for higher concentration and strength. And I mentioned before the energy that it takes to take out like the nutrients in water uh, is not insignificant. It's, it's significant. And so um, I think there's unfortunately, you know, there may be the need to up the robustness of those recycling plants to be able to accommodate. Um, also, the corrosion has tends to happen when the water slows down and it kind of stagnates in the sewers a little bit because of less flow to move it along. And so I don't know if they're doing, I think that I've heard of some like flushing that's happening or periodic, like more maintenance to basically move stuff along the sewers so that it doesn't build up the gases that then like corrode the metal or the concrete. Where can one find resources to determine the availability of stormwater based on ge geographical location? Stormwater, like, say that again, Laura. I think, um, where can you find a resource to determine the availability of stormwater based on geographical location? Mm. Well, for rainfall, I can say that NOAA is a good source, the National Oceanic. Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. <laughs> um, they have, we look at two sources. One, we'll look at their mean and uh, like statistical monthly probabilities of rainfall, um, which can be available for any site in the US based on um, climate stations. And then for detailed design of cisterns, we use their daily record. They will often publish daily data for periods of 20 to 30 years typically that rec record like the precipitation at any of these state specific weather stations. So you can actually like model your cisterns based on real daily performance, at least historically. Um, to get translate that into stormwater, that is a non-trivial thing because runoff is highly dependent on the site conditions. And so that's a stormwater modeling effort. But for rainfall and gathering water off of rooftops, there are a number of tools that actually tap that NOAA database, or you can do it yourself. The, uh, the EPA or the federal government has like a rainwater harvesting calculator. If you Google it, that's that's pretty useful. What does it mean for reuse standards to be risk based? Okay, I've got one minute. I'll explain that briefly. So most <laughs> most reuse standards have been based on like prescription. Like you have to hit this much of X, Y, or Z in the water, or or disinfect it so that there's only, you know. Fecal coliforms has been the indicator organism. Like there's only like two of them in there or 200, whatever it is. Um, they have not necessarily been adaptive based on the risk of the, of the condition at the site. So risk-based um, water quality standards look at, you know, the risks of the public and then 
different levels of indicator organisms to make sure the water is clean and is, is truly disinfected. And so they are um, less prescriptive that you must do X, Y, or Z or hit X, Y, or Z. They're more adaptive to like, you have to hit a six log reduction in path, these various different types of pathogens. And as long as you can showcase that that's working, that that meets the amount of risk that we're willing to take for this type of reuse. It's a different way of thinking about it. And the Blue Ribbon Commission has some good primers just to, to read about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I, I um, just want to thank you, Aaron. I think you've made this is a kind of a difficult subject or a very large subject, and you made it very understandable. Um, so yeah. thank you so much. Um, there are more questions, but we will um, answer those offline. Great. Hey, thanks, everybody. Great, great to see you all. Thank you, everyone. If you've made it this far, AI California will submit you for AIA credit. Um, you should be receiving a follow-up email in the next couple days or sometime next week, um, and these credits should be on your transcript in the next couple weeks. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach us. Thank you guys so much, uh, and thank you, big thank you to Laura and Aaron today for doing today's webinar. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Great job, Aaron. Fantastic.